My name is Artem Avilov. I never thought that I was going to reveal any of this to anybody who didn't already know. In 1962, a major event occurred in the Ninets province of Russia. You wouldn't have heard about it though, as everything about it was covered up. It was an event I decided that I would reveal to the public on my deathbed to escape the consequences of talking about it outside of the group of those in the know. There's no need for me to summarize it for you, as I've kept a journal in which I documented everything that happened during those odd months. I have transcribed the relevant part of the journal for all of you to read. I should mention that I have nothing against anyone's religious beliefs. Just don't hurt people because they don't believe what you believe. If they have to defend themselves, they will. With nothing more to say, here it goes. Entry 1 it's September 29th, 1962. I'm with a team of six, currently en route to an area southwest of Koravur, where we will be conducting one of the most significant experiments since the Great Patriotic War. Our commander has been planning this out very carefully for months and we aren't going to mess it up. Entry 2 It's around 5pm and we're at a station in an area surrounded by trees. There is some snowfall and I've been shivering even in the two layers of clothing. The experiment begins in five minutes. Let's see how far we get. Honestly, I'm kind of nervous. Opening portals is a huge deal considering we don't know where they will take us. I wonder if America is doing the same experiments right now. If they are, hopefully we're ahead of them. Entry 3 We've done it. When Abramov flipped the switch, both machines buzzed and then a light appeared between them. The light appeared as if the air was paper and the light itself was a hole. The portals open right now. This isn't like anything that I've ever seen. Entry 4 Our investigator Galkin stepped slowly into the portal. After about 10 seconds, he stepped back out and described what he saw. Green forests, dark objects gliding through the air, and then I heard sirens, but I came back before I could see anything more. Before we could ask any more questions, a fleeting presence filled the air. I glanced at the portal. A white mist was floating out. It was shiny and transparent. I traded looks with the others who couldn't stop looking at the figure. The presence emanating from the figure became crushingly strong. Our commander ordered for the portal to close. He flipped the switch and then the portal shrunk immediately, closing on the mist which fell to the snow. The presence lifted and the mist, writhing around in the snow, slowed down to a stop. Its shininess had dissipated, its white color had changed to gray. Entry 5 We did not know what the mist was supposed to be in the context of its reality. Even with Galkin's description, sirens, black objects hovering in the sky. Generally speaking, it sounded like what Galkin witnessed was a reaction to a disturbance of an unknown magnitude. We asked him if he saw any markings anywhere. He told us that he saw none. No tanks, no choppers, nothing. We asked him to go into detail about the black objects. Before he could answer, a bright light appeared in the spot the portal had closed. It expanded, taking the same appearance as the portal. For some reason, the portal had reopened and it wasn't us. As we watched with looks of confusion, a dark creature hovered out of the portal. The appearance of this thing sent chills down my spine. It was a multitude of rotating rings covered with eyes. The eyes had a sinister glare and the thing itself made this wet, growling sound. It was atrocious. I could feel the chills from looking at this thing despite freezing in the cold air. I glanced at our commander. He had a look of disgust on his face, a look that turned into one of fear. He took out a pistol and opened fire on the creature but it didn't stress. It just kept hovering. I couldn't help but take out my own pistol and fire at the thing myself. That didn't do anything either but hopefully it was sending a message though. Eventually, the creature hovered back into the portal. I knew that we should have expected this. We had just discovered an alternate world in which presumably, whatever creatures we saw were normal. 
Abramov flipped the switch, but the portal refused to close. He flipped it again and it wasn't closing. And then something else stepped out of the portal. This time, it was a being who looked like a middle-aged human man. The only thing was, he had a red glow. An aura. I then noticed the otherworldly look of murderous rage in his eyes. A look that sent chills down my spine. He stood in front of us and began to speak in a soft tone. Gentlemen, I'm speaking in a language that you can understand so I can be as clear as possible. I don't know who you are, and neither does the ophanim we sent. But you guys need to know that you have just triggered a mountain of chaos. We don't recognize you either, said our commander. But we do know you're not recognized as something that exists in our world. You're an anomaly. Oh, is that so? Asked the man. I can't get any information from your spirits for some reason, so I'll ask. Was what you just did an accident? Pardon me? Asked our commander. You know what you did. You know what happened when you shut this portal. Oh no, said our commander. There is an unknown and uncertain misty figure seeping into our world. We had to close the portal. Interesting, said the man. I mean, I'm just curious. No matter what though, we're going to take measures into our own hands. What are you trying to say? Asked our commander. You killed Yahweh, said the man. That should say enough and I'll be back with the others soon. So prepare yourselves. This war will be a short one. The man stepped back into the portal. Once he was gone, the portal had closed by itself. When he said Yahweh, the first thing that I thought of was Yahweh from biblical literature. He even mentioned an Ophanim, which I'm sure I've heard a priest talk about some time ago. The people in that parallel world used the naming conventions of the Bible. What did he mean by Yahweh then? I asked the others. And Galkin brought up the Ophanim, telling us that he had some Christians talk about it before. According to Galkin, the way the Christians described it sounded a lot like that floating, rotating ring creature that we had just seen. I took it as coincidence. I wasn't ready to believe that we had actually killed God. That idea sounded unfathomable. Crazy. The inhabitants of the alternate world probably just so happened to be named as such and such. Galkin walked up to the transparent gray substance that was supposedly the corpse of some being called Yahweh, and he bent down to get a closer look. Entry 6 We took the substance to a lab and ran some tests on it. Once we got the results, we were shocked. We could determine the substance was made of a material that we had not only never seen before, but have also never discovered before. Entry 7 We've been conducting experiments for the past few days. Further experimentation on the mystery material that has led us to finding out how to destroy the material. This discovery is huge because if we did kill a mystical being, and we were about to fight a war against its comrades, we were in dire need of weapons that could give us the upper hand. I'm filled with dread thinking about being overpowered by unknown entities, especially that rotating bunch of wheels. I'm going to assist in the construction of guns and bombs made for destroying those otherworldly things, and I won't stop working until the weapons are ready for use. Entry 8 And the weapons are ready. Backups have been assembled in case we need them. Now we wait for our preparation time to run out. When the glowing man returns, we will be ready. The top Soviet commanders have been covertly ready in the Red Army for war in an operation called Fighting Angels. The only thing that I'm worried about, however, is that we don't know what those beings have in their arsenal. Hopefully our weapons are strong enough to at least incapacitate them. Entry 9 this was a complete surprise. I woke up at 3 in the morning to the shouts of my comrades. One of them barged into my room and told me to hurry. They've arrived. The war has begun. All their men glow. This was it. I made sure that I had the needed artillery with me, 
As I anticipated the defense, I could hear gunshots and sonic booms echoing from some distance away. As I sprinted out the door, all I could see were flashes of red and white lights off in the distance. It was freezing, but my blood was boiling with eagerness, adrenaline, and dread. On my way to the scene, a soldier running a few feet ahead of me combusted into a white light. My adrenaline spiked. I ducked behind a nearby bush and poked my head up to look for any glowing man. One was headed my way, shrouded in a deep red glow that emphasized its face. It had a deep look of anger and determination. I aimed and opened fire. The glowing man was torn to shreds, vanishing into the night. The guns worked, but did we have enough ammunition? To avoid anybody coming close to finding out about the war and the outcome of our experiments, our commanders decided that we would be receiving news via word of mouth, rather than through radio communication. Code phrases were to be used otherwise. Deaths would be covered up as well. Any dead soldiers were going to be cremated and then honored in secret at a later date. Nothing about the war was allowed to be recorded or broadcasted, and every civilian in Ninets who were aware of the war was to be sworn to secrecy. Our commanders were really doing the best they could to cover this up. Day one was full of uncertainty, the glowing men were everywhere. Every other minute there would be one or two of them running along the trail. It was odd seeing them be torn up by our new bullets. It was something out of a dream. I only got the opportunity to sleep every once in a while. Even despite attempting to sleep in an underground cellar, I was too busy trying to control my breathing. At times, I would nearly fall asleep, but then I would hear the sound of leaves being rustled and I would be wide awake again. That all kept going on for three weeks before things began to slow down. The glowing men began arriving in smaller groups, and their faces were becoming more and more vengeful. Still, I could only duck and hope for the best, killing these dreadful creatures from another world before they could kill me. Entry 10 it's week three, day five. I finally received some news. A soldier walked up to me with a look of exhaustion on his face. The glowing men are cornered. Our men are guarding the portal. They're shooting each and every glowing beam that comes through. Entry 11. Week four, day one. I awoke at four to a strange wet growl. I grabbed my gun and tiptoed to a spot beside the window. The growling was giving me chills. As it went on, I peeked out the window, and my heart sank when I saw it floating underneath the light emanating from a lamppost. The wheels, the floating, rotating wheels covered with eyes. It was just hovering in one spot. It shined in the light, but it was still ugly and monstrous. I aimed and fired at the thing, shattering my window in the process. The bullet hit the creature, but all that came of that was a white steam that started to float towards me. When the steam cleared, the creature started moving towards me. Its silhouette and speed it made my stomach turn. I fired at it again and hid behind the wall to get out of the view of the window. White steam seeped in through the shattered window. I took deep breaths in an attempt to calm my adrenaline. It was almost pitch dark, but I noticed the wheeled creature's dark silhouette as it floated in. It was only slightly darker than the night. I fired at it again. It stopped, but I couldn't tell if I had done any damage to it. My door squeaked open. A flash of light illuminated the face of the person entering. It was a man, a soldier. My brother. I watched as he combusted into a human-sized white flame which itself illuminated the entire room, including the wheel creature. It had a few bloody holes and an unmoving wheel. My heart dropped a second time. This thing can kill, threaten lives. My brother, he was incinerated like he was nothing. His existence gone in the blink of an eye. I fired three more shots at the creature. Finally, it combusted into a white flame. The heat from which nearly burned my skin. When the flames died down and the heat had dissipated, the fear was all that remained. The glowing men were one-shot kills but the wheel creatures. We were going to need to fire several times which could lessen our time and the amount of bullets. I can't begin to think about going to sleep right now for the sake of my life.
I'm too exhausted to transcribe more of the journal right now. I'll post more entries as soon as I've transcribed them. I won't be poisoned just yet, so I have time. Here are some more entries from the journal. I probably have two days to give you the rest. Anyway, the Soviet Union killed God while conducting an experiment with interdimensional portals. And then they went into a covert war with a large group of glowing men. Entry 12 On week 8, day 3, I got word the glowing men had stopped coming out of the gateway. The portal had closed and a letter was left behind. Apparently the letter read, We don't and can't understand your world. Reading the minds of your people is impossible, which could only mean one of two things. One, an alternate Yahweh is the almighty God of your world, who isn't letting us into your minds and spirits. Or two, there is no God ruling your world. Yeshua, the son of Yahweh, has taken the throne in heaven and now oversees heaven and earth. He has instructed us to turn the other cheek and close the portal to your unpredictable world. I chuckled at the incredulity of what I heard. So it was God and we had really killed him. But this couldn't be it, right? I lost my brother to God's vengeful angels. If I had to fight and be in hell with them, then so be it. Once I reported back to the base, I met my commander for the first time in weeks. So, the war ended today, huh? I asked. That was another intense one. It ended two days ago, said the commander. Did you get the news? About the glowing men being God's angels, and the fact that we had killed God. Yes. Top commanders want to open the portal and sweep heaven for its crimes against our union. If Jesus really keeps his word, we shouldn't have a hard time doing so, I said. I was glad that the war was over. As for the wishes of those at the top, I can't stand the thought of going through the portal. The angels wanted us dead, and their creatures were terrifying on top of being deadly. But I can shake it to defend the Union and avenge my comrades. Entry 13 Over lunch that day, discussion surrounding God and the Bible was mounting. God was dead and his angels avenged him by killing a bunch of us and we were supposed to take it. What surprises me is that God was real in the first place. I was raised an atheist, although that's probably due to Stalin's crackdown on Christianity. My parents never spoke of any religion or God, so practicing religion always seemed alien to me. I had a babysitter who was obsessed with God, but I never practiced religion with him. I don't think I need to understand what God's army was trying to convey when they killed my brother, but it for sure wasn't all that good. Entry 14 I'm sitting at my bed right now having just read a letter from Khrushchev. This is going to be interesting. Moments ago, letters were handed out to each of us. I could only guess that it had to do with Yahweh. I opened mine up. It was a statement from Khrushchev. I read it all the way to the end without hesitating. This is what it said. In the past two months, we suffered great casualties all at the hands of beings, religions, worship, and call good. Reviewing the Holy Bible, I have found multiple instances of God or Yahweh committing atrocious acts during the time that he was alive. Exodus chapter 21 verses 20 to 21 Anyone who beats their male or female slave with a rod must be punished if the slave dies as a direct result. But they are not to be punished if the slave recovers after a day or two, since the slave is their property. Leviticus chapter 25 verses 44 through 46. Your male and female slaves are to come from the nations around you. From them you may buy slaves. You may also buy some of the temporary residents living among you and the members of their clans born in your country, and they will become your property. You can bequeath them to your children as inherited property and can make them slaves for life. But you must not rule over your fellow Israelites ruthlessly. Peter chapter 2 verse 18 Slaves in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, 
not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. Remember, slave labor was a thing in America and slave owners used the Bible to confirm their supposed righteousness. Then there was Job. Job worshipped God more than anybody but had his family and pets killed by God as a way of proving to Satan that he could kill and abuse the people who followed him, and they would still have faith in him because of his insistence that he was great. God was so full of himself, he betrayed his own people to prove himself and to serve his own ego. Samuel chapter 15 verses 2 to 3 This is what the Lord Almighty says, I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go, attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them, put death to men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. Children and infants were included, not spared despite their innocence. I thought the Bible was fiction written in a time when people killed those who related to criminals by blood, but seeing as we made contact with a world where beings like the ones written about in religious scripture are very real. I can proclaim that we have been attacked by another cult army led by a mad, egotistical tyrant who would go as far as eliminating those who don't follow their beliefs, as well as those who aren't able to make rational or irrational decisions yet. We will reopen the portal and then we will march into heaven and overthrow whoever has succeeded Yahweh and replace them with a victim of their forced suffering. Your commanders will give you detail on when Operation Fighting Angels will continue. It seems like I'll be heading into a land of horror and uncertainty. I just got consumed by chills recalling the Ophanim. Every time I recall it, I get a sense of impending doom. Hopefully I can take them down before they take my life. Entry 15 I'm about to head out to the portal. A ton of us are going in. This is the weirdest thing that we have ever faced but all I want to do is to make it out of this alive. Entry 16 Well, I can say that I made it into heaven, but I'm completely lost right now. A pit formed in my stomach as I neared the portal. We went in a single line, probably the longest one that I had ever been in. As I stepped through the light, I nearly froze, but then I saw the other side. A healthy green forest, a beautiful blue sky. I looked to my left and noticed some mountains in the distance. Despite all of that, there was an eerie calmness. Like you're being watched by somebody but you can't figure out where they are. As we walked through the forest, there was tension in the air. I held my gun close to my face and continued to follow behind my comrades. Soon enough, I heard an ear puncturing boom. And then I was blinded by a light and pushed back into the soldier behind me. We both fell onto the muddy ground while the others fired in the direction that the boom had happened. I rolled into a bush and refocused while breathing heavily. Peeking out of the bush I noticed two glowing men navigating through the trees. I fired at them both as quickly as I could. I hit one of them but I missed the other. He shot a look of determination in my direction. I fired at him before he could react. I just kept going, looking around, waiting till I was in the clear, and then moving through the trees, heart beating fast as I made my way to a good spot to take cover for when I needed to. I had to have traveled miles through that forest before anything else had happened. I heard some shouting followed by multiple sonic booms echoing throughout the area. My heart sped up even more. I ducked behind a bush and I remained alert. I moved several times and shot countless glowing men. Every single time I'm about to take a shot, I dread missing the target. I would die for my country but I wish to continue serving Khrushchev and his anti-Stalinist agenda. Entry 17 After a few minutes of rest, I sense an overwhelming presence. I peeked out of the bush and beyond the tips of the trees, there was a giant set of rotating wheels adorned with eyes. It had to have been miles wide and miles tall. My heart sank. 
I watched as a dozen shiny white beans descended into the forest. My view of them was soon obscured by the trees. I had no other choice but to run and make sure that I continued contributing to the mission. I jumped out of the bush and sprinted for my life, navigating the dense forest. As I ran, a series of ear-puncturing booms shook the ground beneath me. About ten minutes of heavy breathing later, I reached a cliff. Off in the distance was a rail yard on the edge of a small town. It was packed with probably hundreds of people. However, I was too far away to be able to determine if they were my comrades. As I watched on, I heard a thud behind me. I turned around and saw a glowing white beam with four heads. Three of them looked just like the heads of animals. One of them looked like a human head. Before I could react, I was knocked unconscious by an invisible force. I awoke in a basement with cracked walls and dented pipes. A man who looked to be in his fifties was sitting in a chair directly across from me. He had shiny hair. My first thought was that I had been kidnapped. However, this man was not glowing. What did he want? He chuckled. Oh, so you're one of the soldiers from a different dimension, he said. Yes, I said. Soviet. Oh, I know. I heard of the experiment. The portal closing in on God and just like that, they died. I didn't have much to say. My head was still spinning from everything that had happened. And so I asked him who he was. I'm the one that you're going to help, he said. Are you an... An angel? No. I don't associate myself with people who exclude and kill those who don't follow or torture his so-called truth. You're willing to fight with us? I asked. Yes, he said. You guys did something that shattered our universe. The uprising is now going to start three years earlier than I had originally planned. The man balled up his hands into a fist, and then a patch of blurriness appeared between the man's face and my own. The blurry orb became an image of a white church with a crowd of people huddled around it. I could see movement in the crowd. The devil was showing me a film, or a form of extrasensory vision. He explained it was what was going on all over planet Earth. There were religious people huddled in and around each and every religious building on the planet. Young people, old people, animals too. But not just people, he then showed me a different vision. One similar, one to the last, but taking place at the Notre Dame Cathedral. People were clogging the roads and some were sitting on top of cars. When God died, the world went into a collective shock. Since then, depression statistics have skyrocketed. People have become agitated, blaming one another for God's death. He showed me a vision of dead bodies lying in the streets of New York City. If I went to earth to spread the truth about God, I would be outcasted. And God tried to frame me as the evil one, and he did so successfully, just by making me a main antagonist. And then over thousands of years using popular culture to frame me as a giant red bull with horns who had a lot of spiritual power and did all the bad things that God did. Wars, a natural disaster is cannibalism. God enabled all that, not me. I've been hoping to one day put an end to God's ruthless vengeance. I couldn't be anything more than amazed, especially with the part about him being framed as the evil one. I couldn't believe it, but I was speaking with the actual devil. They followed him so blindly, the devil said, like they don't know he's in support of torture. They spin it as his great plan, but that's just rationalizing the torture that they're being put through. They were told, hey, follow this man, for he's the righteous one. They all just went with it, and he won. Anybody who disobeyed him was executed, even despite being commanded not to kill. Some of them argue that it's righteous, but if killing is bad, then it's bad. I've killed, but only because God forced me to for the sake of his own ego. God killed a two million. I killed five, not five million, just five. One with the power of God could bring those five lives back, but Yahweh didn't want to. I still couldn't believe it. The devil was on my side. I kept listening as he told me the New Testament was God gaslighting his followers. 
Just because somebody apologizes for something they did doesn't mean that they didn't do it. If you instill trauma, don't expect somebody to come back to you. But then you have those religious extremists who harm people in the name of God. They're brainwashed children. At least those who aren't abusive see God in their own liberating way. This was beginning to hit close to home. I tried to sway the conversation to the uprising that he mentioned. Well, if God is dead, who are we going to bring down other than the angels? The devil shot me an understanding look, a distinct one that I had never been given before. Who do you like, women or men? We've constructed many different types of weapons for this very patriotic war. It's alright, you do what you're actually comfortable with doing. You're accepted here. The devil went on to explain the uprising. Now that God was dead, all we had to do was finish off his army. Easier said than done. There were not enough soldiers in the devil's army to give, in his words, the captives of hell the upper hand. That was until the army that I'm in angered God's angels. Half of them swarmed my reality and apparently we had massacred them all. They were unfamiliar with the laws of my reality, but they were too vengeful to stay away. Now the remaining half sit in heaven, having massacred nearly all of my comrades. My heart dropped at the news. The devil, however, told me that I didn't need to feel an inch of concern as some time ago, he had convinced a third of God's army that the deity they worshipped so much was actually the devil lying to and gaslighting everyone. The angels believed that to be true and so they mutinied. They all got sent to hell for uprising. Apparently, my army killed as many angels as those who mutinied, leaving only one third left. How many angels did my comrades and I kill? I asked. Over a million, said the devil. What? What about guardian angels? There has to be billions of them. Especially after the baby boom. How is one million only a third? Guardian angels don't fight God's war. They surveil children, the devil said. What's Jesus Christ doing in all this? I asked. Jesus Christ was the human manifestation of God not a separate entity. Now it's time to get to the planning stage of the uprising. The devil laid out his plan. Essentially, we were going into heaven in groups and then using guerrilla warfare to destabilize whatever order they currently had. After that, a vote would be held for a new leader, a new god, a god who would establish a new order and clean up the mess that Yahweh made. But there was a catch, one that wasn't surprising. There's a 50% chance you perish in the uprising no matter how well you take cover. My heart still sunk, however, but these beasts had to be stopped. I was in a position where I could help sway the order of heaven, which this concept was still very incredulous to me. Either way, it was what I had to do. My intuition was screaming at me to go and fight. I was going to end this. After the plans were discussed, the devil told me that he wanted to show me a little something. He brought me upstairs to his living room, and there he told me to look out the window, and when I did, a pit formed in my stomach. People were hanging from the tree branches of every tree. The grass was yellow, parked cars were vandalized, and bones were lying on the rooftops of homes. I shuddered and I looked back at the devil. Who did those bodies belong to? Innocent doctors, psychologists, teachers. They were men who liked men, women who liked women, people with blemishes, women who wanted to be without a husband and choose what to do with their own lives and their own bodies. Oh, and some of those bodies you see are still alive. You couldn't tell which ones though. They're in shock due to multiple factors. I'm sleeping in the basement tonight. I recommend you follow through on that promise. Who in their right mind would murder innocents? The devil sighed. At least the Soviets are a necessary shield, he whispered to himself. Why wouldn't we be? Oh no, I meant that differently, no. Anyway, before we do anything else, I'm going to show you a wider picture of the world out there. The devil brought me out to his car, a yellow four-door with dents and scratches all over I was taken on a drive. Moving down the road, I gagged as bodies hung from the trees. 
Some swayed, the road was cracked and had a few holes filled with red liquid. Moving along a main road, I noticed a very similar scene, but there weren't as many cars around as I thought there would be on a road like that. A few minutes later, still moving down the road, the devil pointed out a gang stabbing taking place in a parking lot. People were walking by looking dead in the face, not reacting to the dispute. The devil then hit the brakes. A dozen, I'm not sure what to call them. Small spiky animals would have spit many fireballs every three seconds. They were walking across the street. One of them was carrying what looked to be a charred human hand, but I'm not so sure. These things were clearly dangerous and my heart rate increased as I waited for them to pass. Eventually they did. And moments later a truck with an eerie logo passed us from the opposite direction. Forbidden meat, it's not immoral. What was that supposed to mean? If somebody comes to the door and asks you to meet them at a special restaurant at 5pm and they don't have anything official on them, close the door, the devil said. That was the only thing he had said to me the whole drive. The rest was just pointing. Aside from the first few things I mentioned, I witnessed a young man being shot in the neck, saw boarded up windows on several shopping centers, saw five crumbled homes, ten groups of homeless individuals, and a lamb with five eyes that stood in one spot, staring at me with a look of sinister determination. It was a crazy scene out there, but I guess that's what I had to know. The cage that God put innocent people in was the same place that he put killer creatures, murderers, and other monsters. Entry 18 I'm sitting on a bed in the basement, while two mattresses stacked on top of each other would be a better description. I hear animalistic screams echoing from all directions outside. There's now a deep pit of dread in my stomach. I don't know what might happen to me while I'm asleep. Hopefully, I'll wake up without a mark. Also, the windows down here don't have any curtains, so I'm going to turn out the lights so that none of whatever the heck's out there will see me. I managed to save myself one more day. Here are the rest of the entries. Entry 19 My heart's pounding and I don't know where I am and I can't say for sure whether I'm safe. After I set out with my group, we bypassed the guards by tunneling under heaven until reaching the sewers. I guess the devil thought the sewers would be mostly unguarded, but once we set foot in them, shouting started coming from both directions. Glowing men. My heart dropped. There was nowhere to duck and I shot at the men, relieved to see them combust. As we tracked through the dimly lit sewers, I took note of how horrible it smelled. It didn't matter so much every time we neared a corner. My adrenaline level skyrocketed. Would there be glowing men waiting for me and would I live? I resorted to just shooting blindly around the corner. It had worked five times. Eventually, we reached a drain one of my group members claimed was the first one from the city. She told me to follow behind. Since they could hover, they would just fly up out of the sewer. Since I couldn't hover, I would climb, but I would be guarded in a circular formation. From there, I would shoot any angel coming overhead. Easier said than done. I need to stop expecting ease of force from my end. Once I climbed up to the street, the sonic booms began. A dozen angels flew above the street. I opened fire for my life, taking out each angel as they flew close enough for me to hit. I barely paid attention to what was happening on the ground around me. All I heard were booms, shattering glass, car alarms, and shouting from all directions. At one point, I needed to take cover. I looked around and saw all the chaos. I ran through a shattered shop window and hid behind a table. An angel landed on the ground. I shot at it and decomposed it. As I anticipated, the second another angel revealed itself. A deep male voice hit my right ear. Hey, you from the kingdom of the devil or are you of God? I looked to my right and saw an elderly man pointing a double barrel shotgun at my head. Some shouting echoed in from outside. I looked and saw two angels sprinting towards the shop. Are you of God? Answer the question. 
I jumped out from behind the table, the two angels' eyes widened. They aimed their guns right at me. I grabbed the shotgun wielder by the hips and pulled him in front of me. He combusted into white flames while I jumped behind his desk for cover. I jumped up and fired at both of the angels. Both of them combusted as well. The war went on for weeks. Those weeks weren't so different from weeks that I spent fighting wars in the past. In the middle of week four, I woke up as the sun began shining and noticed how silent the city was. Perhaps all the civilians had evacuated. During my journey through the war-torn city, I came across a restaurant with shattered windows. I took a look inside. The tables were all lying on their sides. Food was strewn all over the floor. As I looked around, a wet screeching noise echoed from the sky. I looked up. A giant Afanim was about to fly overhead. My heart sank. I jumped through a shattered window to hide in the restaurant. I knew it took several bullets to take out a small Afanim, but I couldn't imagine what it would take to bring down a giant one. The dreadful sound of the Afanim peaked, but once it began to pass, I took note of a television on the far end of the room. I walked up to it and switched it on hoping to get some news updates. I flipped through the channels until I found a broadcast showing a giant Afanim hovering above a city that I couldn't recognize. Many of the skyscrapers in the city were on fire, and then explosions rocked about 10 or 15 of the skyscrapers, taking each of them down. Meanwhile, fires were spreading like crazy across the surrounding forest. And with that, heaven's final option is hammering the city at the center of hell. The destruction of evil in the name of God has begun. I watched in horror. Heaven's final option, innocents are dying, people are being tortured. As I fumed, I heard the sound of somebody stepping on a piece of glass outside. I didn't have time to turn my head before I blacked out. I woke up in someplace dark. Feeling around, I felt a cold, hard tiled floor. What room was I in? Who captured me? I felt around some more and found a lamp. I switched it on, revealing the room that I was in. Torn up papers, photos, and posters were strewn all over the ground. Entry 20 After writing up the last entry, I looked through the torn up papers. Some of them depicted God, Jesus, and different angels. Others were pages from the Bible. I held one of the torn pages and read half of what was on it. I crumpled it up and threw it at the wall. The door creaked open. I jumped, hoping that it wasn't one of those glowing men. I grabbed my gun and aimed it at the door. I was relieved to see that it was a non-glower. She had black hair and looked to be in her mid to late twenties. Her eyes widened. Oh no, it's okay, she said. I'm on your side. Your fellow soldiers are going to be back soon. I was relieved, but I didn't know who she was. Was she associated with the devil? Or was she someone else entirely? I asked her. Eve, she said. Your fellow soldiers need you. I know they do, I said. We have creatures to eliminate. You've already pretty much won the war. Don't let your guard down now. Because the angels are avenging God and destroying hell as we speak. Your soldiers need you to help them bring in a bomb that you and them call the Paracousma, according to them. The Paracousma was an atomic bomb that we were developing as part of the construction of anti-anomalous weaponry following the accidental death of God. I told her this, but I also informed her of the fact that we hadn't tested it due to our efforts to conceal our war on Yahweh's spirits. We would only test it in the most dire of times, times when a war with the West wouldn't sound so threatening. She told me that I was ordered by the words of my commander to help bring the bomb into heaven. I told her that I needed to be shown something official just in case even though she already knew of the weapons development project. She brought me out into a large room with shiny marble walls, a high ceiling with three skylights and a marble tiled floor. Several of my comrades were conversing with each other in the corner, some recognizable from previous missions and others not. One of the ones that I recognized, Dimitri, told me the order was legitimate, and then he told me that we needed to get back to the portal. 
A pit formed in my stomach. Is it still open? I asked. How far away is it from here? Where are we? Yes, it's still open, Vladimir said. The devil has our backs though, don't worry. Now get prepared. My comrades left the room leaving me alone with Eve. Eve walked over to a gold-plated chest that sat a little over to my left. She opened it up, reached into it, and pulled out a stone with words engraved into it. She placed the stone on the floor in front of her. What does it say? I asked. They're the Ten Commandments, she said. Well, five of the ten. The other stone is still in the chest. I'll be taking care of that one right after I take care of this one. She brushed her hair back with her hands. I wasn't sure what she meant when she said that she'd be taking care of them. That was until she pulled a jagged rock out of her pocket, bent down towards the stone and began to scrape the first commandment where it was engraved in the stone, leaving white scratches. I don't know if you've read my story, but I was the one who was manipulated into eating an apple, she said. Adam was responsible for me. You and blamed me for him failing to be responsible. Adam was punished and so was the serpent, but so was I. She began to scratch out the second commandment. All that apple contained was knowledge on how to separate good from evil. That's what God wanted to keep hidden, and he expected us to know any better. The devil wants to set up a new kingdom led by a new leader and there's been some talk of me most likely being the next leader. If so, I'm going to undo all the terrible things that Yahweh did. She moved on to the third commandment, scraping it like no tomorrow. And Job refused the position. He said that he just wants his livelihood back. Adam finally realized what he was doing when he blamed me for him not taking responsibility, and the devil told me that he doesn't plan on being the next leader. So that leaves me... Well, isn't the devil very powerful too? I asked. Not as powerful as you may think. She said as she began to scrape the fifth commandment. He's not the exact opposite of God. He just worked for God. At some point he realized how crappy God was and rebelled against him and his order. He's more of a political influence. But anybody can be God with a specific piece of knowledge. My comrades entered the room. I walked up to them determined to get the rest of the fight over with. One that I was more familiar with, Dimitri looked into my eyes. You ready, Artem? He asked. Yeah, this place is chaotic. Almost everything here is throwing me off guard. But if I keep up my willingness to fight and defend, I should be able to defend myself against those atrocious creatures. My comrades all nodded their heads in agreement. Despite the agreement, there was something else on my mind. My location. Where was I? I asked my comrades as I heard the second stone be placed on the floor. Well, you're standing in God's mansion, Vladimir said. We wiped out most of the guards and low-level employees. We hoped that Noah would be here as well, but we didn't find him. Still, they had some pretty powerful guards. It took minutes to kill some of them, but we pulled it off. We can now sincerely say the throne of God is occupied. Where's the devil? I asked. He's hiding out on earth, Vladimir said. He believes that we can pull this off, but we also need to get the four giant Ophanim creatures to hover in one spot. Wiping out their guards and low-level employees should do it, I said. It will not, Vladimir said. They can be replaced. There needs to be a big enough distraction to get all four of them in the same area. The devil has a plan he hopes will work. He didn't tell us what it was, so it must be a job for a smaller set of higher-up individuals. He hopes? I asked. There's a 60% chance it will, he says. Vladimir said. We are dealing with powerful beings. How powerful is the Paracousma? I asked. Is it anything like AN-602? It's twice as powerful, comrade, Vladimir said. Are the devil and Eve going to be hiding in a shelter? I asked. The devil told me that he, Adam, and Eve will be hiding out on Earth. 
watching heaven's central city get vaporized, Vladimir said. Well, all right then, let's continue. We must wait for the devil's comrades to arrive, Vladimir said. Remember. I know, I interrupted. We're bags of flesh going up against anomalous beings. But now that we have more time to discuss things, what do you think the effects of this will be? We've discovered interdimensional travel. It happened to be this dimension of all the possible ones. And if the West finds out what we've been doing, they would hold it against us. We'll see where we can go from here, Vladimir said. I nodded my head in agreement. This did feel like the beginning of something and I was going to experience it. I turned towards Eve who was reaching into the golden box. Both stones were sitting on the floor all scraped up. Nobody needed those commandments if they were also commanded to do things that contradict them. Eve? I asked. Yeah, she said, pulling an object out of the box. Thank you. This will all be over soon. Eve was holding in her right hand a golden goblet cup adorned with red diamonds close to the rim. You're welcome, she said. Eve tilted the cup, a red liquid is spilled out onto the floor. Once all the liquid had been poured out, Eve set the cup on the ground and stomped on it, making a sizable dent. She stomped on the cup again and again and again until it was pretty much flat. And then she looked at us. You guys need to leave. This room is off limits now. All right, let's go, Dimitri said. We stepped out of the room, leaving Eve to her business. In the lobby, we met up with the devil's comrades who asked us if we had everything that we needed. We each told him yes, and with that, we were on our way to finish this. We marched down the deserted main road, past all the abandoned shops with blown out windows. We were expecting just a few angels, but then that noise came back. That wet growl. I looked up and saw a giant oaf in them slowly appearing in the sky. The clouds separated for it and I felt terrified at it. My heart sunk so deep that I froze for a second. Get to the sewer, I yelled. It was our only way out of this one, and I couldn't stress it enough either. It had to have seen us out in the open. One of Satan's men ran to the nearest sewer drain and pulled it right off. My comrades and I were the first to go. I sped down there and then I began jogging south. I looked behind me seeing my comrades all having made it down and the devil's comrades floating in. However, only half of them were in the sewer when a blinding white light beamed through the manhole. One of the remaining comrades shouted, telling us to run. I expected it to take at least an hour for us to get to the portal, but two hours had gone by and we still weren't there. The smell was unbearable and I had no idea if a horde of glowing men were about to swarm us, and we only had half the devil's men we were supposed to have. My fear turned into reality when I started hearing familiar shouting echoes from both directions. Oh great, it had happened so quickly. My memory is hazy, but what I can say is, when we heard the voices, the devil's comrades shielded us. Once they rounded a corner out in front of us, it was just deafeningly loud booms for five seconds. We waited silently, then before we could count to ten, a couple more rounded the corner. They were shot and killed. One of the devil's men, David, signaled for us to remain quiet some more as he walked towards the edge of the intersected sewers. Before he reached it, a black rectangle with moving eyes peered around the corner and shot David with a beam of light. Dread overtook me. There was an oaf in them down here. Why was I so afraid of them? Other than because they were killer creatures. Their appearance was just terrifying and creepy. All those eyes. I aimed my gun at it, waiting for it to peer around the corner again. Another of the devil's men started towards the spot that the oaf in him was. When he neared the spot, he tossed a grenade. It exploded and the oaf in him hovered out from behind the corner while making the worst screech that I had ever heard. A third of it had been blown off. It was leaking heavily and I was barely able to stay up. It landed on the ground, continuing to screech. I opened fire at it. One shot and it was gone. 
Eventually, David told us to stop moving. He pointed to a drain up ahead and told us that it was the nearest drain to the portal. This was all almost over. Good. But then David told us that we were miles away from the portal, so we needed to be quick. As he told us, the giant oaf and him were probably hovering around the central city. He got a call on his radio. This may be shocking, but the devil's plan has failed. We need to get through the portal before any angel finds out what our intentions are. That couldn't be too hard, right? We climbed out of the sewer. The sweet smell of fresh air was delightful. A great break from the stench. All we needed to do was hurry through the forest. We ran for what felt like an hour. We avoided buildings, farmhouses, everything. It was going to take a while to reach the portal, so we discussed hideouts for when we needed to sleep. At some point, we came across a bunker, and David told us to get inside. Before I could step in, somebody was shouting in our direction. What are you people doing with my shelter? I looked to my left and saw a farmer. Training, I lied. He picked up a shotgun and aimed it at me. You guys look like those invaders. Get out of here or I'm calling the police, he shouted. In defense, I shot him and he combusted. I stepped into the bunker where I met up with my comrades. After we woke up, David told us that we could pile into the pickup truck in the driveway and proceed with the rest of the trip. He insisted on protecting us on our way there. There were six Soviets, including me, so two could sit in the front, and four could sit in the bed of the truck. It seemed simple enough. After breakfast, we made our way to the truck. My comrades and I hopped into the truck while the devil's men took their positions around the truck. And then we began our journey down the roads of the farmland. Adrenaline rushed through me as I thought about the possibility of being found and vaporized by a giant OFNM. About ten minutes away from the portal, the truck broke down. We pulled up to the side of the road and made the rest of our way on foot across the calm forest. Some moments into the walk, I saw a white light shining in the distance. That was it. Shortly after I spotted the portal, I heard it again, that echoing growl. I looked up for a quick second and saw a giant Ophanem. I picked up my pace until I was running as fast as my legs could take. Once out of the forest, my adrenaline spiked. If the Ophanem couldn't see me in the forest, it could see me out in the open field of grass. It took me a few seconds to realize that the Ophanem hadn't harmed me, although it seemed like it would have already. I could still hear it growling up there, and worse, I felt it staring. They burned my psyche and they were chilling as hell. I reached the portal and without looking back, I sprinted through it. I didn't at all mind the transition from the warm climate to the snow and freezing air. The second before I ran through the portal, I felt four sets of eyes staring at me from behind, followed by four thuds behind me as well. The air got warmer too. I didn't have much time to think about it, as I needed to get to the arsenal in which the Paracuzma missile was housed. I was then ordered to guard the portal so I went over and stood by it. While on guard, a gruesome and terrifying statement was made to my comrades and I. It didn't change what I thought about heaven or God, I mean not at all. In fact, it made it all a whole lot worse. It happened so suddenly and I happened to be glancing at the portal when a human skeleton covered in ash was wheeled out by a flaming man. It's hard to describe where his flames began and his body ended. The air heated up like an oven in his presence though. He gave me a smirk and then he said, Let this be an example of what will happen if any of you step into heaven again. The flame consumes the wicked. He turned around and stepped through the portal and back into heaven. The air began to freeze, but my disgust wasn't going anywhere. Once my comrades arrived with the missile that was pointed out the portal was in the wrong position to fire a nuclear missile aiming for the center of heaven. So we put the machines powering the portal up on a platform, and then connected the platform to a helicopter. Once the helicopter lifted the portal high enough, we carefully aimed the missile at the needed angle. 
Within minutes, we got three of our commanders to vote on the decision to covertly launch the missile. All three of them voted to proceed with the launch. It was time. Not a minute after the vote, the missile was launched. It flew through the air without an issue, gliding perfectly. It flew through the portal and then the portal closed. The platform was slowly lowered back to the ground and then disconnected from the helicopter. It was determined the city would be far enough away to make a quick observation from the heaven side of the portal. However, remembering what the flaming person had presented, my heart dropped. I didn't want my comrades to be incinerated. I showed them the skeleton and I told them what happened. What was his name? asked my commander. I wasn't told, but the fact that we can't recognize them says enough. How will we know if we've succeeded? I had enough of this. If this was where traveling through portals was going to take us, I might as well go back to my regular life, the one already full of near-death experiences. I'll go take a look, I said. If I don't come back, then we probably failed. I stepped up to the portal, expecting to be met with excruciating pain. I stopped. Wanting to let my comrades know that we won, I stepped through the portal. The first thing that I saw was a huge mushroom cloud. The wind was still blowing from the explosion, but it had clearly died down by the time that I had arrived. Two giant ophanims were lying still on the ground, burning up in flames. Their eyes were lifeless and gray. A third one floated erratically through the air, left to right. It too was up in flames, but not as much as the other two were. The flames were definitely spreading though. I smiled for the first time in months. The wild beasts were dying. As I looked up in relief, a flame caught my attention. Four separate fires were spreading across the grass. Adrenaline rushed through me. The giant ophanim let out an echoing shriek, chilling enough to catch my full attention. I looked up and saw the colossal creature hurling towards me. My heart sped up. I leapt backwards through the portal, tripping and falling backwards into the snow. My comrades cheered. Despite the fact that I was still alive, I was in panic. I got up to my feet and shouted at my commander telling him to shut the portal. I explained what I had seen and then everybody gritted their teeth. The portal was then shut before any fires or ophanum debris could get through. Entry 21 I can finally start a new entry. I took a break from writing for a couple of days after the end of the war. The central government is going to cover up the loss of 1.5 million soldiers for the sake of not heightening tensions with the West. It's not something that we usually do, but the situation we went through was nothing usual. It was an incident that we don't want to talk about. The mechanics are far too confusing. Entry 22 I never thought that I would pick up this journal again. Today is November 16th, 1964. Minutes ago, I found a film in my basement that I didn't see yesterday. All set up and everything. The film was in color and began in a field of grass. In the distance was a forest. Further off in the distance was the skyline of Metropolis that lined up the horizon. And then there was a flash of light. The light dissipated and in the distance was a growing mushroom cloud. The film ended with a total runtime of 15 seconds. It was amazing to see the actual explosion. That was a major historical moment for them. The film came with a letter, and this is what it read. Ardom, thank you for assisting my people in the uprising. The new god in power has sealed off my reality from those entering with malicious intent. So I can let you know what I wanted you to know, but waited for the right time to tell you. I knew the right time would be any time after I received your help as you would have likely taken criticism terribly. What I want you to know is, you and your fellow Soviets need to know torture is never okay. I'm not sure if you're guilty of it yourself, but if you are, please change your view on it. The Soviet Union is guilty of many of the things it criticizes. Sincerely, the one they call the devil. All I'll say is, I'm glad that I started out as a draftee rather than a blunt psychopath. 
I wonder how things are going in heaven, hell, and earth. Hopefully everybody's in a better place than they were before.